Well, joining me in the studio now is our Royal Editor, Sarah Hewson. And down the line, we're joined by The Sun's TV critic, Ali Ross. Very good to have you both with me today. Quite a remarkable story. Quite a lot of kind of deceptions and redactions and concealment. An enormous amount of our money as licence fee payers spent on trying to prevent us, the licence fee payers, from actually finding out what occurred. I think I've asked Sarah to reprise for us what actually happened and what are the issues with the Martin mm. Bashir interview in the first place. And then we'll talk to Ali Ross about his feelings about the BBC's conduct since, etc. So, Sarah, to remind people, if they haven't been following this very closely, about the Martin Bashir interview, the Panorama interview, what Princess Diana said, the enormous impact that it had at the time as 200 million people around the world watched it, and then what transpired a great deal later, mostly at the behest and the urging of the late Princess Diana's brother, Earl Spencer. Yes, and Lord Dyson's report in 2021 laid bare the deception that had been used by Martin Bashir in order to obtain that infamous panorama interview where Diana claimed there were three of us uh, in this marriage. Mm -hmm. uh, and Prince William said at the time that her paranoias had been played into uh, by Martin Bashir and that he felt the interview had worsened the state of his parents' uh, marriage and, of course, the consequences and what went on uh, to happen, we all know uh, all too clearly. Now, Andy Webb, the investigative journalist you just heard there, has been fighting a long-running freedom of information battle with the BBC, trying to get documents and emails to see who knew what when at the BBC within senior management about Martin Bashir's deception. Uh, last month, a judge ordered that documents were released to him. Finally, last night, uh, after further delays, they were released. 3,288 documents, 10,000 uh, pages of documents. But among them, Andy Webb reckons, 20 to 30,000 redactions. So the secrecy what a redaction is, is people who aren't quite that is sure. censorship. So it's blacking, yes, basically. Yes. So you, blacking... You've got a page full of writing, but one paragraph is completely black, you can't read it. The next paragraph is completely black, the following page all black, can't read any of it. Can't read any of yeah. it. So what we have learnt from this is that in an email in 2020, Martin Bashir claimed that there was racism and class discrimination. That was to blame uh, for the scandal and the allegations uh, surrounding deceit being used uh, for the Panorama interview. And he said there was irritation that a second-generation immigrant of non-white working-class roots should have the temerity to enter a royal palace and conduct an interview. It would have been so much easier if one of the dynastic families, Dimbleby et al, had done it. So he's saying that basically no one would have asked questions about anyone else. And, of course, a year later, uh, the Dyson report uh, came out. And, and let's just uh, revisit the sorts of deceptions that Martin Bashir employed to get Lord Spencer to lean upon his sister, the late Princess Diana, to give Martin Bashir an interview. He didn't just say, listen, hello, I'd really oh. like to interview you. I'd just really like to know how you feel about your marriage and what you think about the royal family. Please, may I interview you? And they just went, yes. The subterfuge involved in getting that interview was absolutely extraordinary, including paying somebody to forge, forge documents bank statements. that didn't exist. So just to explain what, what that yeah, was about. Forge bank statements. There were suggestions uh, that the, the royal family had hired the Secret Service to spy on Diana. There were allegations that Charles had been having an affair with their uh, children's nanny, Tiggy Legbook. Uh, there were so many deceptions used in order to get in and persuade Diana to do this interview. Now, I, I think Diana was always going to sit down and do an interview, mm -hmm. but it was with whom and also what she said and how she felt as she went into that interview. Uh, and the fact is that this played on her paranoias. Now, let's bring in Ali Ross on all of this. Ali, um, this is one of those stories that is so convoluted and so full of concealment, deception, not least it appears at any rate, the BBC doing its absolute damnedest with our money to stop us Ooh. ever finding out the minutiae of how deeply, deeply ingrained the deception was. But what we can see is their determination that we would never know quite the extent of it. Well, exactly. They're playing a very dangerous game here because, as, as always with these things, it's, it's not the initial offence which often brings the most chaos and, mm. to an organisation. It's, it's the cover-up. And that's what looks like is going on here. Um, the BBC have very airily said, well, the rest of the information is just irrelevant. Well, 
in that case, put it out there, let us decide, because as long as you redact so much information, people are going to uh, draw their own conclusions from this and decide that, that the BBC still isn't being completely honest with the public here, despite the inquiries which have, which have gone on. And uh, if, if they're sensible, they'll stop wasting any more licensed payers' money and just give Andy Webb everything, because they have a great deal to lose here I mean, if they continue wonder, on this I mean, you wonder, don't you, pump. Ali? You wonder where the dispensation comes from. Who signs off? the BBC's decision to spend £150,000 on trying mm. to stop the general public finding out whatever the convoluted communications were that both led to Martin Bashir doing what he did and then tried to conceal what he'd done from everybody else. You wonder who says, OK, yeah, which, which legal firm are we going to employ? Oh, them, OK, excellent. How much do the barristers cost per hour? Oh, fine, excellent. All right, sign that, sign this. You know, yes, that's absolutely fine. Remember, this is the BBC, I and mean, I worked there for 30 years. It's a BBC sure. where they, they ruled out any biscuits in meetings, like, God forbid, they pay for a digestive biscuit, because that was a... <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not exaggerating or joking. It was a profligate use, profligate use of licence fee payers money couldn't have a packet of digestives absolutely not you know no taxes to bring guests in too expensive couldn't possibly do that and oh yes we are going to prosecute the elderly if they don't pay for their licenses of course we are we're going to make sure we pursue them to the nth degree and get those damn licenses paid for but what we're going to just okay is 150 grand to stop people knowing what we've been doing inside the BBC. Now, who is the person that gives the OK? Is that Tim Davey, the controller, or is it, is it the chairman? You, who thinks that's OK? Well, you, you can't imagine this has been done without Tim Davey's say-so. I'm sure it's gone through half a dozen committees on its way to him and then back again the other way. But uh, if he's any sort of boss, you'd think he, he would have to be over every single detail of the Bashir case because it is incendiary. Um, this is going back 25 years now, although it took 25 years for Martin Bashir to realise there'd been racism rife at the BBC, because it would have been a lot more convincing if he'd made the allegation at the time. Mm. But I, I'm, I'm sure Tim Davey is all over this. He, he, he better be, given the amount of money that's being spent here. But one, one of the extraordinary parts of all of this, it seems to me, and of course, I haven't been party to any of the redacted documents, I only wish I had had a good read of them, but I haven't, just as nobody else has either, apart from the people who redacted them. And who are they, we'd love to know? Who went in with the black pen or the computer with the black Ooh. thing saying, not this, not this, this is not relevant, we say it's not relevant, even though the judge has said, hand it over, we're not going to, not relevant, not relevant. Who's that person, I'd love to know? Where are they in the exceptionally high-paid BBC hierarchy of management? Who's doing that redacting thing? Are you Minister for, for Redacting at the BBC? What kind of a job is that anyway but there's all of that um going on but 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 one of the things that's amazing it seems to me is this idea that martin bashir is saying that whatever's been said about him is caused and motivated by racism within yeah. the bbc because of course the push to expose Martin Bashir and what he did and the, the deception and the, the, the complete obfuscation he employed, including forgery, to get Lord Spencer and the late Diana to give the interview, um, a, was, exposed by the, was exposed by Earl Spencer, not by the BBC. The BBC didn't come for him. What does it matter whether people thought anything of him in the BBC? That's not how all of this rose well, to, to it, public knowledge, is it? Sure. It's... it's... <laughs> He's, he's doing what's known as playing a Megan, which is the race card from the bottom of the pack. And I don't doubt for a moment there was professional jealousy at the BBC, but I can't, I, I just do not believe that there was this level of racism he's talking about, which is just a man who's also claimed he's too unwell, by the way, to give any sort of comment on the issue, but seems to have been exchanging hundreds of emails about it. Um, was victim of any racism at all. It's just he's saying, look over here, don't look here, because of what he's done, we're bordered on the criminal. Uh, and it, it's a classic distraction technique. Let, no let, me, bring, let me bring Sarah in. For a moment. Yeah. Well, let's not forget that after allegations were first made around the use of deception by Martin Bashir, he was rehired yes. by the BBC as, as religious, religious, religious affairs yeah. Yeah. Uh, editor. And, and it is remarkable that so much effort is being gone to to protect uh, Martin Bashir, uh, given what we now know from Lord Dyson's report, uh, which puts it out there in black and white, just 
how he managed to obtain that interview. Yeah. And now the process for Andy Webb is to go through these redactions and try and work out well, where are the suspicious bits and then go back into court mm. to try and get them unredacted and try and find out just who knew what. When? Well, I'll tell you what I remember from inside the BBC about all of this, um, uh, Ali and Sarah. I remember not, not racism, not people saying, how is it that Martin Bashir got that interview being from an ethnic minority? Not that at all. That's not what I remember. I never remember anyone saying anything like that. But what I do remember, both hearing and I think to some extent feeling myself, and I don't know whether you thought it at the time, but like, why him? Who is he? Has anyone heard of this guy, Bashir? Because at that point, until the panorama interview, I, I mean, his family, I'm sure, thought he was delightful sure. and his next-door neighbours knew who he was, <laughs> but the rest of us had never heard the name Martin Bashir until that moment. He was not a prominent journalist at the BBC or anywhere else. And the, 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 the comment that I remember hearing was, wonder why he got that interview. How do you think he got it? Who is he? Have you heard of him? He's quite young, isn't he? Do you know who he is? Why, of all the people in the world, has Diana decided to talk to Martin Bashir? Nothing about his race, nothing about his ethnicity, only about the fact that he was kind of quite junior to the point that no one had ever heard of him. That's all I remember hearing at the time. Well, Jenny Bond, who was royal correspondent yeah. at the time, said she'd built up a relationship with Princess Diana. They'd been having tea together. Mm. They'd had long discussions and that was her first question well hang on a minute if this was happening yeah why was it him yes exactly but nothing to do with his race just because he's someone that nobody had ever heard of you just thought well how did this guy that we've never heard of manage to secure this interview so then when Lord Spencer pursued it and pursued it. And when we finally found out that he had had false documents printed, including uh, pay slips, false pay slips, you know, d duplicitously printed mm. by a forger mm. <laughs> to, to, to imply that, you know, members of the, the household staff were taking bungs, which they weren't because it was entirely false and completely, completely uh, cooked up by him. When we heard that all of this had happened, then we thought, ah. Oh, that's how we got the interview, because at the time there was just no explanation or answer to how somebody nobody had ever heard of would land this unbelievable interview. And I don't think it was jealousy at all. I think it was incredulity. Mm. People just couldn't understand it. Then when we found out what he'd done, then we could understand it. That's basically it, isn't it? Yeah, I, I, think, I think that's right. I think people wondered, of all of the people Diana could have chosen to be interviewed, yeah. by how did he do it? We know that he was being snuck into Kensington Palace, that they were going out for drives in the car, they were discussing it on, on country lanes, for example. Uh, but we now know, of course, that there was so much deception that convinced her to do that interview. And, of course, Earl Spencer was used by Martin That's Bashir right. to convince his own sister. Exactly. So, Ali Ross, what do you think of the fact that the BBC didn't just say, having been pushed and pushed and pushed by an indefatigable Earl Spencer who just wasn't going to let it go, he just thought, this is my sister and I'm just not having it. I'm carrying on and carrying on. You totally get why as well. That the BBC didn't kind of say, by God, this is a terrible stain on our reputation. We're terribly sorry. You know, this is what happened. You know, Martin Bashir went rogue. Uh, we didn't know he was doing it. Or, you know, this one and this one did know he was doing it. They, you know, their heads have rolled. We're just, you know, we couldn't be more contrite. What a terrible thing. We swear we'll never do it again. But instead of doing that, spend 150 grand trying to stop us finding out. What's that about? Where does that come from? The, the crazy thing here is, is that these stories about what Bob Bashir was up to go back to 1995 itself, because yeah. the, the Mail on Sunday broke the initial story three months after the interview went out and said, this is what's actually gone on. And of course, it was dismissed at the time. So they've, they've, they've buried it for, for decades. And eventually, kicking and screaming, they will have to release everything at the cost of probably a couple of hundred thousand more to the license players who are screaming for the details all to come out. So it's, it's futile, it's self-defeating, and it's enormously frustrating for anyone who is a, a protector or in any way a fan of the BBC or who pays for the damn thing to keep going because it will have to all come out in the end. All those who work there because, mm. you know, we know there have been hundreds of job cuts yeah. at the BBC, the merger of the, the two news channels, Newsnight yes. being cut, slashed in half 
for example. So I think there'll be many within the BBC feeling very angry at this use of money. And, and actually, it's very embarrassing when you work at the BBC, as I know, when you're doing the news and you're doing current affairs, you have to cover stories about the BBC when you're at the BBC broadcasting on the BBC. And the whole time you're thinking, oh, my God, you know, are the people listening or watching thinking that this programme that I'm now presenting on the BBC might be somehow infected with the same kind of corruption or dishonesty or whatever it is, and you're kind of a mouthpiece on the BBC explaining a BBC story in which the BBC's conduct has been absolutely um, appalling, you know, and indefensible. And it's a very awkward thing for, for, for you know, reputable journalists to have to do, actually. And in this case, the BBC is arguing that the redactions are allowed under freedom of information. Now, you can redact things to protect people's personal information. That's absolutely fine. But what Andy Webb has said, and I think we can uh, agree, that 20 to 30,000 bits of personal information that need redacting. Yeah. And they'd argue that these emails were irrelevant. Well, the release of the one about Martin Bashir citing professional jealousy and racism proves that they're not all irrelevant. Yes, Ali Ross, a final word from you on this? Um, well, it's, it, it's probably going to take another two or three years for, for the, this will kick on, be kicked into the long grass. And for every month it does that, it just gets worse for the BBC and more embarrassing, as you said, for the newsreader who finally has to go on at the six o'clock news and say, we've done this terrible thing. And you feel embarrassed on their behalf. But it's, it's never the people who should be explaining it that have to go on screen and actually do it. It's absolutely true, actually, and, and you know, because I was working at the BBC, you know, right through the, you know, the Jimmy Savile scandal, where you have to broadcast about the scandal from inside the institution that you're working on, and then the Russell Brand and Jonathan Ross Radio 2 scandal, where I felt I was so humiliated to even have to talk about what they'd said to, uh, you know, left the message on Andrew Sachs's answer phone when Andrew Sachs was in his late 70s, and it was about his granddaughter. You know, it's just, it is, it is a very difficult thing to do in a kind of professional, dispassionate way when you're in the actual building, where all of this is kind of happened it's I mean I'm not saying feel sorry for BBC journalists in general but it is a very peculiar professional requirement to make of people who have had nothing at all to do with it and somehow end up being or feeling as if they're the spokespeople for this particular story anyway thank you both very much indeed good to have you both on the program